to his country in the new cast of Blanca. Join the boys in the sun and explore all that Spain has to offer. Right, a little bit of shopping for me and for you, getting those essentials that everybody needs to get when they're over in Spain. Where better than the supermarkido? Hey, <laughs> Spanish, coming on a treat. We are going to go this time to Carthage with the Carthaginians to Mar Menor. Mar Menor, small C, minor C, the squidgy C, and Hannibal and his elephants. You won't forget the elephants, will you? You eat like one. Listen, they've got a lovely system here. You don't have the woman on the till weighing your veg. You do it yourself. Red pepper into bag, bag onto scales, and then simply press the button that shows a red pepper. Q, receipt. Stick it on bag, bag in your bag, and off you go shopping. And if you're doing it, only get the essentials, all right? Sir so Stanley Matthews, you know, used to do breathing exercises on the beach at Blackpool every morning. <sighs> and there's nothing like going for an early morning swim to get the system going. In fact, we love using seawater and water in general for health purposes, don't we? Spa towns. This place uses it big style. More about that in a minute. First of all, we are in Mar Menor. Ma means sea, menor means little, right? But it's not a sea at all, it's a salt water lagoon. Huge, huge mass of water, but actually it's surrounded by land. You can't see it from here, except for a couple of dots in the distance. So get him to do one of his maps, to show what it looks like, a sort of aerial view, okay? Now show them the peninsula that locks in this salt water. Hmm. Use your pencil. It's 22 kilometers long. Hmm? No, not your pencil, the hmm. peninsula. Right, there we go. This area is like the warm costa, often referred to, because it gets lots of sunshine, because there's nothing to get in the way of the sunshine. But here, they rub mud all over their bodies, scoop it up, and they rub it all, and it's black absolutely black and you leave it on and apparently it's very very good for you if you've got bad skin bit of rheumatism bit of inflammation on the joints you know does you the world of good well you know a bit of a bone in my leg does you the world of good and this water they have done tests on it is full of natural minerals mainly because it's trapped water but it's all in there and all you have to do is get your kit off and get in no I'm not but what does Ma Minor suggest to you? Beethoven. What? Beethoven? C minor. I get it. Very good. I bet you can't sing it. Go on. Um... Hey, you've got a good voice for a synchronized swimmer. my health theory that is a little hospital or clinic which has a jetty which runs down towards the sea with some changing rooms in it where you can discreetly get changed and go for a little dip or put the mud on and have a shower at the end rather like Victorian Britain you know like they used to have in Brighton Dr Brighton Ooh, like come out in your little Victorian smock and go for a swim now then this place is also a prawn nursery Absolutely true. 
every day they get the prawns and they put them in a classroom and they say now then little prawns who brought rice to Europe as it happens yes Percy prawn what do you think the answer is very good Alexander the Great yes give that boy a cocktail Hola amigos a todos, ¿cómo estáis? Today, this time, it's going to be Brandy Alexander. I can see your face already. Brandy Alexander is a small, rich cocktail, ideal after a meal. What you do is get a shaker, put some ice. When you get your shaker and your ice, get a grater and some nutmeg. Very important part for the taste. Only a little bit of it is enough. The main ingredients are brandy, a good dash is very important, and coffee liqueur, in Spain we use cream cacao, ideal, brought from Colombia, very nice drink, nice and thick as you can see, and top top with cream, once again squirty cream it's sufficient. We'll shake it, make sure it's well blended. And here it is almost ready. Just look at it, it's nice and thick. That should be enough. Hmm, so it's quite good that. Huh? Mm, I think I'll try that. You can see. Typical. <laughs> hey, there's a connection there. Carlos the first. You know, there's Carlos doing the, the third. Oh, and yes, I know that's all about Carlos the Third. I'm talking about Carlos the First. It's a really nice brandy you can get over here. Now, we are in Cartagena. It's actually spelt with a G, but you've got to pronounce it che. So, Cartagena. What? Stop spitting on your lens, did I? Right. Well, its original name was Carthage Nuvo. Carthage, as in the Carthaginians, over in Africa. They came here. So impressed were they with it that they named it after their own capital. Now, the person that came here was a man called Haz Struble, and he was Hannibal's, as in the famous Hannibal's, brother-in-law. Keep it in the family, that's what I say. Now, he set up base here. It was rich in minerals, it had the five hills around it, which was a natural defence, and it had a beautiful harbour. Dead impressed, hence the name. Hannibal came over, got together some men. Now, when I say some men, 60,000 men. That's a lot of people, especially in those days. And he marched from here with his famous elephants all the way up the east of Spain. And we've seen some of those places already. And eventually he got to the Pyrenees and he went over them. And then he got to the Alps and he went over them into Italy. He was there for 17 years. His mum must have really missed him. And he must have loved pizza. Eventually, the Romans drove the Carthaginians back. And eventually, out of Carthage Nouveau. Now, Cartagena. Hey, look. Christabel Colon. We've mentioned it before. Why on earth we call him Christopher Columbus is beyond me. But we do. A man of few words. Whereas I've got a few more to do. And the first word is probably what I don't. <laughs> Understand. Entender. Entender. Actually, that's quite a nice one, isn't it? Mm. Entender. Yeah, yeah, it's got a nice flow to it, that one. Oh, and like is the next word. Gustar. 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 Okay. Hate. Odiar. 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 It's like odious. Mm. Yeah. Odiar. Odiar. But not O. O. Odiar. 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 Okay. And take. Tomar. Tomar. 
tomar. And give. Dar. Dar. Mm-hmm. You're nice also very... Yeah. Are they getting better? Mm. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the Carthaginians were kicked out of Cartagena by the Romans, 209 BC. They stayed here for 616 years until they were kicked out themselves. Obviously, during that time, they made a bit of a mark, left a bit of an impression. This has only just been discovered. It's an amphitheatre. They found something about ten years ago, but only three years ago did they realise what they'd got. This has never, ever been filmed before. You're filming it for the first time, it says Augustus. And it talks about his family and that the theatre is dedicated to them. The theatre was paid for by Augustus's family. Top hole. What a thrill. Round here, don't slip in the mud. They are slowly sifting through everything. From here, which was just getting towards the stage area, so I have to do... Calm down, Mrs Hargreaves. It's only a vegetable. It's not actually. It's bigger than that. You can see the seats going back up there. But on the other side, it's slightly more confusing, and the reason is simple. There was a fishing village there. They've had to take it down. They've put quite a lot of it in the museum. In fact, our guide remembers this area as a place where he used to come and have a drink. It was full of bars and pubs and things. Now look there. You can see they've used columns. They've just smashed up the Doric columns and shoved them in to make a wall. There's bits of Greek, look, Greek marble. Can you see that white marble over there? It's been shoved into a wall just to fill a gap. Amazing. Over this way, three arches that were the entrances to the theatre. That's the other end of that uh, piece of rock that's never been filmed before. The big arch here, and then two little arches going off at the side. And down here, a path that led to the back of the theatre, where the actors would have gone in, and also to a garden area. Just to give you an idea of how seriously Spain's taking its history these days, they're pulling those houses down next to get at the garden. Right, we're being pulled up sharpish for the break. Cartagena, as it looks from the castle on top of the hill. It's a big place. You've got the bull ring down there and the old hospital, which they're doing up. Make a great hotel. I don't know what they're going to do with it. And they found a Colosseum under there. They're going to spend 10 years digging that one out. Fantastic. In the distance, on the hills, you can see some round bits. That's where the mines used to be, where they quarried for gold and for silver. 40,000 slaves working for the Romans in one of those mines. Rich in produce. You stick it on a ship and you flirt it off. Now look, this is the best defensive feature of Cartagena. It is that the port is almost landlocked with these five hills. Perfect. You know, there was a general in the 1600s who said there are only three safe ports in Spain, June, July and Cartagena. It's good, that. It's three. The, uh, the Moors used this place for building boats. This is where they made their fleet. In fact, the Spanish fleet seems to be based here. Still to this day, there's a huge naval base. Sir Francis Drake caught them a bit unawares. 1585, he came into the port, blocked the Spanish Armada, and blew it to bits. Now look over here. Remember the Colosseum we were looking at? Where do you think these stones came from to build the Arab castle? From the Colosseum, and look! Columns. Slice them up, stick them in the wall. It's always when I'm doing some fabulous history that that's... Telling tips is Tim's trademark. Heidi high. should you set fire to your teeth shortly before they get stolen, you need to know the people to get in touch with. If you're cruising around in your brown hire car, you're bent on a roundabout, the names on the frames go like this. Medico, doctor, dentista, dentist, hospital, hospital, pharmacia, chemist, it also has a green cross, bomberos, fire brigade, ambulancia, ambulance. 
Guardas Seville are the sort of police you would report a thief to, and the Policia Local are the traffic police. Inside is a card which has all the numbers on. You can usually get one from tourist information people with the right numbers for your area. Okay, that's that done. There you go. All the numbers, and it's got a taxi firm on the, on the other side. Same word, of course, taxi. Right. Go and do some pritch pictures. Pritchers. You can do pritchers if you like, but make them nice. Lovely. Though I'll say it myself, you did a good job there. I've, um, I've just been uh, reading up on uh, the history of the place. Now, Spanish wines. I don't know why they spring to mind, but um, you've got to know which are the right ones to get. Now, spookily enough, we just happen to be in a fantastic area for Spanish wines. We'll do the whites and the reds in a minute, but they do champagnes as well, or carvers. Now, this is one you'll see a lot of at home. That was the white one, this is the back. The Gordon Negro, which uh, is uh, very popular and very cheap. Now, Jaime and Nando with some more classical Spanish wines, and I see straight away there's some Riojas in there. That's, the Rioja is the best Spanish wine, isn't it? Yes. Best red, red wines, yes. Definitely. And it's its body, isn't it? It's got a it good body. A lovely body, and uh, it's a very good year as well in Rioja, like this Marquer de Riscal, 1987, this one. But in 1982 probably was the best year for Rioja wines. So if you're buying one, look for 1982. 82 if you can. What, it's makes, what makes a good wine? Well, it's uh, the grape. The grape and the dry weather as well. Dry? Dry weather. So less rain, better, better exactly. wine. Okay, fine. Now, Nando, we talk about uh, red wines, but uh, Spain's famous for its white wines as well. Well, in Rioja they got also very good white wines, but I think that's my opinion. The um, Catalan white wines from, uh, from where they make all the champagne, uh, that's very, very good. They make very, very lovely wines. That is Monistrol, Blanc de Blanc, and very good wine. How much would a decent Rioja cost me? Say, say a vintage Rioja. Rough about ten pounds. Ten pounds. Ten pounds is a, a reasonable price for res reserve. For, for, a, for a grand yeah, reserve, yeah. right? Okay. And this is the one that we see quite a lot at home in a sack, which is the Rioja Siglo. The sack's just a gimmick. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Right. So no, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no, it's just a gimmick. But this one would cost me about how much over here? Uh, about three pounds. Three pounds, and it's a very good year. Three pounds. You see, a brilliant wine for a tenner and a. A very good wine for three quid. It's worth coming here for. Um, I'm, I'm over here. Well, no, no, more sort of behind you, really. I had a bit of an accident. You see, there was this manhole cover thing, and it, and it fell short. Yes. It's a replica of a very early submarine. The people of Cartagena think that it was the first one, but the people of Madrid say that they've got the first one. Anyway, it's very, very dark in here, and I... Oh! Uh, all I know is it was built by Isaac Farrell in 1888, and he didn't have a name for it, so he called it Isaac Farrell. Don't look up my stern. Do you mind? Anyway, I'm down the other end at the pointy bit. Oh, oh. I think I've, I think I've concussed myself. 
I tell you what, get me some Brit that knows all about your health and living out here. Now this time, I thought we'd find out some of the sort of pitfalls that Brits might encounter when they come out here from journalist Andy Ormiston, who's based out here. Andy, first of all, health. We were talking about that. Lots of people come out here who are, you know, in their latter years. They start having a few drinks and doing things they shouldn't do, and they probably find themselves in a bit of a problem. But, yeah, drinking is one of the biggest problems, but health-wise, there's much the same as in England. You've got a very good uh, general public service as well as a very good private sector. Um, for people who become ill, if they're in the public sector, it's just a question of going to the doctor. If it's an emergency, then they can phone up an ambulance, which they have to pay for, or um, go direct in a cab to the nearest clinic, which will be open 24 hours. So they've got to get themselves there? So they've got to get themselves there. Right. If it's private, then they can phone up a doctor who, on 24 hours, they take it in turns and they come out and see you. So if it's something serious and they end up in hospital, what are the differences there? Well, here you've got a family orientated society and really the job of the nurses is nursing. And it's up to the family to come and look after them and do all messy things that are necessary in looking after a patient. And, and feed, feed them as feed well. Them as yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole lot. So the nurses just do the, the medical nurses bit? nurses are doing the medical, look after medication and proper nursing. What about language? And also, uh, you know, medical language. Uh, there must be, you know, yeah, well, pitfalls there. It's always a big problem with language. Um, it's one of the biggest problems because they have to take an interpreter with you to the, to the doctors unless you can speak the language fluently yourself. But um, there are instances where it causes laughter. There's, uh, I mean, one of the common ones is to say, I am embarrassed. 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 Well, that's what you say in English, but in actual fact, you'd be saying that I am pregnant. So yeah, <laughs> you're a bit over the top there. <laughs> um, another one might be uh, very common at this time of year is a uh, story constipado. Uh, you know, the English constipated. Constipated. Yeah, that's whereas natural white you've got a very bad cold, so you need to be blowing your nose a bit more. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you've been out here for a long time, haven't you? I've been here just eleven years now. Um, I came over mainly to please my wife, but I'm glad that I did because we pleased both of us and my children and we're here. She's Spanish and we're quite happy here. You're a happy bloke. I'm quite happy here, yeah. I've done a lot of things that I would never have dreamt of doing in England. Well, that's good stuff. Cheers, Andy. Nice meeting you. And you. Thanks very much, Tim. Actually, I didn't even put enough in to blow my cap off. <laughs> hey, well, that's it for Cartagena. I bet you don't know who liberated it, you know. Got rid of the Arabs. James the first. Yes, it was. It was him again. Got about a bit, didn't he? Do I think he had any stand-ins? Hey, what a great job. James the first stand-in. You get all the chicks, the wine, and one or two cities as well. <laughs> so you've got your stuff then, have you? Jolly good. Now look, next time we're going to go to Murcia which is wonderful with its gorgeous cathedral, a casino, and a huge water wheel, and we're going to see an enormous freezer, much, much bigger than this, in Totana. Now let's see what you got. Water and loads of tins of baked beans. Oh, you're going to be fun to share with, aren't you? Well, I suppose I did say keep it to essentials. So, I've... Uh, I've... I've got mine. Come on. <laughs>